Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Tessa Archibald. I am a policy associate for the Animal Welfare Institute, and I manage the Homes for Horses Coalition. Just a couple things to keep in mind as we get started. Please stay on mute for the most part so that we can hear our speaker clearly. This is being recorded, so if you need to hop off, no worries. Uh, you'll be able to come back and watch it at a later time. If you registered uh, before today, you will have received a blank business plan template in your email. I'm also gonna put it in the chat in just a minute if you haven't seen it. Many of you joining today are members of the Homes for Horses Coalition, but for those of you who aren't, I'm just gonna share a short introduction. The Homes for Horses Coalition has been active since 2008 when it started as a unique coalition to help horse rescues and ultimately help the equines by ending horse slaughter. Today, HHG is led by the Animal Welfare Institute and the American Wild Horse Campaign and has over 500 members who are equine rescue directors, equine professionals, and equine advocates all over the country. HHG is dedicated to providing spaces for collaboration and connection within the equine rescue world, as well as furthering advocacy to improve the lives of equines through legislation and policy. We have a great speaker joining us today to talk about developing your equine rescue plan. Joanne Miller is the executive director of Brook Hill Farm. She is a retired professor of equine science at Randolph College and co-created the equine curriculum for the state of Virginia. Her passion is looking at the well-being of horses through science. She has been the co-chair of the PATH Equine Welfare Committee and served on the Heady Equine Welfare Committee. She's currently the chair of the Equus Foundation's Equine Welfare Advisory Group, the HHRF Board, and the HHRF Wellbeing Committee, as well as the Virginia Horse Council. And she coaches at the national level, level for the United States Pony Club show jumping team. She speaks both nationally and internationally on the well being of horses, equine human interactions, and best equine business practices. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Joanne, if you want to take it away. All right. Welcome, everybody. Excited to have everybody here, especially for such a boring topic as a business plan. I am gonna to try to make it fun and interactive. So please, if you wanna, um, when I ask a question, please feel free to join. So we're gonna start with how everybody, can everybody see my screen first of all? Um, good, I, I'm getting some nods, that's good. Okay, we're just gonna start with how to create a business plan. And guess what? It's not working. Oh, there it goes. So how many of you feel like this with all the paperwork and everything that you do? Everybody agree with me? And I'm going to try to, I'm going to see if I can get rid of my, stop my video so I can look at my notes. Okay, so how many of you feel like this? I know I feel like this all the time. And wouldn't we rather be playing with our horses than doing all this work? Well, the whole purpose of this is to show you an easy way so we're not so buried in our paperwork. Because bottom line is we have to make money in order for our organizations to thrive. So we got to create this business plan and it, obviously a business plan needs to be based on your organization. So what is the purpose of a business plan? It's really so that we have everything in one place. It's to keep our data, our finances, our strategic plan, and it's to be used for accreditation, major donors and grants and foundations. If you're like me, I have many, I wear many hats in my job today as the executive director. I'm not only feeding horses, but I'm also, you know, looking for grants, I'm talking to donors, doing everything. And by having everything in one place on a business plan makes it really easy for me to, to function. How many of you heard of SLO, which is your social license to operate? This is the buzzword this year in all horse, the whole horse industry. And it's basically your local community's acceptance or approval of your organization's presence and ex activities. And really, if you have a business plan, it really makes you think as you're putting everything out to the community and, and what they're seeing. So social license to operate, you know, the business plan is a big part of that. So what is a part of a business plan? We have our mission statement, our programs, the data that we collect, a SWOT analysis. Don't worry if you don't know what these are, we're gonna go over them. Finances, strategic vision, our, a secession plan, and a board of directors. So when you look at this, to me, this looks really overwhelming, which is why for my college students, I came up with this business plan template, which I hope all of you have in front of you. 
So the first thing on your sheet, everybody has your sheet? Everybody's got their sheet? The first thing is your logo. Do most of you have a logo? The purpose of the logo is so that people recognize your brand. This is gonna let everybody know who you are. So at Brook Hill Farm, our logo looks like this and it says helping horses, helping people because we are both horse rescue and a therapeutic riding center. Today, I'm just gonna talk about the horse rescue piece. So your mission statement. Your mission statement is so important. Um, our mission st statement states Brook Hill Farm, a nonprofit horse rescue and therapeutic riding organization exists to provide rehabilitation focused services and safe haven for unwanted horses and offers a therapeutic riding program for personal growth and education for the community, helping both horses and people. So does this mission statement mean I can rescue cats? Anybody? <laughs> Not at all, right? It says that I'm doing horses. Okay, so your mission statement really guides everything you do in your organization. So if you're thinking about doing a program, say you wanna do a community outreach program for seniors, how does that relate back to your mission? That's why this is so important, your mission statement. And it needs to be general enough that you can manipulate and put new things in, but it also needs to be narrow enough that obviously I'm not rescuing turtles. So the organizations you belong to is the next thing. People are really impressed when you're you know, collaborating with other organizations. Um, for instance, I have the Homes for Horses Coalition. Each one of you can put that on your business plan. We're part of the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Again, if you've never heard of that, look it up. It's an accrediting or organization. You can either be verified or accredited. I'm an Equus mentor. The Equus Foundation, I'm just going to give them a little plug. It's really important that if you fill out your guardian application, if you go on the Equus website, the guardian application looks long and involved. Once you have this business plan, it'll make it easier for you to do. But just know, once you fill that out, you're eligible for funding. And they give funding in many ways. Um, not only is it money, but it might be like, for instance, we had a delivery of 10 um, weather beater blankets. So these are, it's a really good organization to belong to. We have the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. Um, we're an accredited organization. Again, another really good um, organization to join if you are rescuing thoroughbreds. Something everybody could do is GuideStar. GuideStar is a wonderful place to put your organization information. Um, funders go to GuideStar to decide whether they might want to fund you because all your information is there, including usually your tax, they, they gather your tax returns. So again, if a donor wants to give money to your organization, this is something they usually check out. So it's a really good organization to get involved with. The Equine Welfare Data Collection, um, again, another one that I'm hoping everybody's a part of because again, we're trying to track how many horses are needing help in the United States. The United Horse Coal Coalition, um, if everybody knows the grant application for free vaccines is due in February 1st. Again, another group, good group to be involved in. And then the Horses and Humans Research Foundation. Um, when we talk about social license, one of the things the Horses and Humans Research Foundation is doing is to show the benefit of horses and humans working together. So again, it's real impressive for your donors to see organizations you belong to. And it may just be something local. You know, feel free to put down whatever you're, you're um, involved with. And then your program titles. Do you do adoption? Do you do rehabilitation? Foster care training? Do you do competitions? Um, at Brook Hill, we have a senior grooming program that we're going to talk about. And the senior grooming program is with senior horses and senior people. Do you do retirement on your farm or sanctuary? This is where you can just list the different things that you do. Everybody following me or am I going too fast? Everybody's good? All right. Your values. It's important to have your values in your business plan so people really know who you're all about. 
I'm just going to give you an example of what Brook Hill has. We've three business plan. And please know if you're interested in this um, PowerPoint, I can send it by a PDF. Um, and I'll give you the information so you can get it at the end. These are the things for Brook Hill values. Um, Brook Hill Farm exists to carry out and inspire the love, care, and responsible stewardship of horses and people by staff, volunteers, and participants. That's something you all could use. Brook Hill Farm's organization systems and practices will afford participants an experience that can instill life-changing skills and values based upon personal responsibility, discipline, and commitment within a strong culture of mutual respect. And then our final one is Brook Hill does not discriminate. So you can see how I've just put my values out there. So for instance, when you look at these uh, values, an organization such as say the Salvation Army who has very similar values may want to fund you. So then you wanna talk about your programs a little more in depth. So I started with Brook Hill Farm is Horse Rescue Retirement and Sanctuary. And you could divide these out and give a little blurb on each one. Now, how many of you have, um, and please unmute so I can have some interaction here with you guys. Um, how many of you have uh, applied for a grant? A bunch of you, yeah? How many, um, how many of you have also, like, if you're not applying for a grant or, or just had somebody come in and ask, what are your programs? This is something that you could share with them. If you have this in your business plan, all you have to do is cut and paste from your business plan and you have all the information, which makes life so much easier. You're not recreating it every time. So this is the way we have ours. We have the senior program, and that's where we have seniors helping seniors, where we've invited the local assisted living groups out to, to help it with our organization. They actually pay to come out. Each senior pays $20 to come out, and then they come and they help groom some of our retired horses. So again, as a program, if somebody said, hey, I want information about your senior program, I can just cut and paste from my business plan, and there it is. Don't have to recreate the wheel. We also do community outreach. And again, again, it's a great cut and paste. When you're doing either grants or even just trying to get donors, you know, if your donors ask, well, what are you doing for the community? I can just easily cut and paste and say, here it is. If you notice I'm using pictures, I do put pictures in my business plan because it makes it interesting. So um, feel free to, to create this however you want to create it, you know, be, be creative with it. Cause again, if you pass it out to people, you know, you want them to want to look at it. So we talk about data and a lot of things are data driven, especially your grant writing. When you're doing your grant writing, they're going to ask you, how many horses did you have? How many volunteers? How many visitors? And this can be a tracking nightmare. So you can do it in many different ways. This is one way that I've done it. And this is for the current year um, or, or all together. Like we've done 554 horses since we started. We have 24 seniors grooming this year. We had 394 volunteers and 153 visitors. And then what we do is you can put it into a graph. So if everybody sees the screen, you can see we started in 2001 and you can see how we've grown over the years. So that if somebody asked me about the history, I can look at this and say, well, in 2001, we started out with 20 horses and now we're up to, you know, including referred, we're up to over 600 helping the horses. I'm hoping everybody can see how this really does help as we're moving forward with grant writing, donor collect, you know, getting more donors. So, and then recognition. Have you been in the newspaper? Put the link to the newspaper you were in. Have you written in a magazine? Have you been on TV? Are you part of these organizations? Have you won an award? Again, this is where you put your recognition down because, again, it's kind of validation and it gets back to that um, social licensing. How does the community view you? You know, um, 
you know, if there's a seizure in your area and you were part of it, cut that out and or put the link on your business plan. This is kind of a document that's continually growing. It's not a stagnant document. I'm constantly adding to this. The hardest part is when you start putting this all together, but once you've got it started, it's really easy to just add in. Like for instance, we were just in the newspaper last week. All I did was pull up my business plan, add the link and I'm done. So this is kind of an ongoing document. And then of course you put your euthanasia policy because as a rescue, people wanna know how you feel about euthanasia. So on this, we've put our euthanasia policy. Um, you know, we are in, in um, we go by the AAP um, euthanasia policy, but what, however you feel about it, you know, this is a good place to put that in this document. And then the strategic vision, how do you want to grow? So I'd love some audience participation. So would somebody like to tell me how they would like to grow? We've got a quiet group here, Tessa. Somebody unmute and tell me how they want to grow. Hi, this is Lila. <laughs> I'm with uh, Lifeline Horse Rescue in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And we're looking um, to grow by getting a new facility, which is not going to be an easy task, but that's a, that's a goal we have. Well, and that's a great, if you know, we just did a capital campaign for a, for a covered arena. So that's exactly right. So how, the strategic vision, you definitely want in your business plan to say, hey, this is what we have, this is what we need, and this is why. Somebody else have another project they're working on. Hi, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania War Horse. Yeah. These off-the-track thoroughbreds that we've, um, some rescue donations, all kinds of ways we get them, and we use them to uh, service veterans with PTSD. And we're currently working on a program for female veterans who have suffered trauma, um, mostly uh, military sexual trauma. Okay, so how are you wanting to grow? Uh, we're adding programs. Um, Perfect. Perfect. So you're adding programs. So when you're adding programs, you may even want to say you need staff for those programs. So in your strategic vision, you might say, I want to add the um, female trauma for the veterans, but I need to hire a part-time counselor to do this, and it's going to cost X amount of dollars, right? That way, when your donor looks at your business plan, they know immediately what you are in need of for your finances. And I think I see somebody I know, Stephen? Yes. Hi, Stephen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm just, I'm enjoying. <laughs> enjoying and learning. Good. How do you want to grow, Stephen? How do I want to grow? Well, I don't know. Uh, not so much, I don't know, just to learn, I guess, to learn more about the horses and your program. That's how I want to grow. Okay. Well, thank you for pop, popping in. All Does right. anybody else have another growth problem? Um, how about, how many of you would like more staff? Anybody oh. needing more staff? Hi, this is Kristen with Over the Hill Equine. We just need volunteers in general. Okay. <laughs> and fencing and shelters. We just started last year, so we we need to grow a lot. Uh-huh. So you need fencing. And do you have how many of how many of the people here have um, I don't know if you can take a poll test, but how many of you have paid staff? And are you paid yourself? <laughs> Donna? Um, I have one part-time paid person who helps care for the horses. Everyone else is a volunteer, including me. So when we think about our business plan, we really need to think about paying ourselves and others. And the business plan is the first step to making that happen because you're, rec you're recognizing yourself as an actual business. And a business has paid employees plus volunteers. So your strategic vision might be, you know, especially when you're brand new, you know, we need to be able to have a paid executive director. What is your time worth? What are you looking to grow for that? We also need to have fencing. What kind of costs are involved with that? Again, your strategic vision, how do you want to grow? What do you see yourself doing? 
And then we're going to get into the SWOT analysis. And this is something that we're going to, again, have a discussion about. So a SWOT analysis is basically your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. So we're going to start with the first one, which is strength. And I think there are boxes on your sheet. And feel free to make some notes on these sheets as we're going through so that we can talk about what are our strengths. So somebody want to shout out one of their strengths they feel is their organization, for their organization. So this is Lila again. Um, one of our strengths would be the ability to train the horses that come in to rescue so that we can better prepare that. So you have donated training. That's a big strength. What else? Anybody else have some another one? We have counselors who donate time. I'm sorry. Counsel mental health counselors that donate time. Mental health counselors that donate time for programs. What else? Y'all aren't praising yourself. What about good executive leadership? Y'all have that. You're all here trying to learn, right? So how about let's put in some good leadership. What else? Are there plenty of horses that need help? What else can you think of as a strength? Lila, again, we do a lot of outreach. So we get, we're getting greater recognition. We're out there, out there, out there, knocking on the doors. Okay, so you're recognized. That's a huge strength because then when people are thinking about donating at the end of the year, people know who you are. What else? I'm gonna give you my list so you can see what I've written. How many of you could write? A lot of you with programs. How about defined proven programs that are working? How about partnerships? If you're a partner, you're, you're partnering right now with uh, HHC, right? How about your reputation? And how about financial discipline? Y'all are still in business, so you must have financial discipline, right? And I bet you have committed volunteers. Anything else you'd want to add to this list? What do you think? This is Lisa. I'm with Loco for Long Years. Um, one big thing is just the backing of the community. We have a community who's very involved and they care, and that's producing the committed volunteers that you just mentioned. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, partnership with the community. So everybody sees. Hey. Like, oh, go ahead. Hey, it's Kathleen from um, Vero, and that, that was going to be our strength is and you know this, Virginia is such a horse-loving state, and we have so many people who care just across the state, but then we also have a lot of horses that are in need, so it's kind of this perfect storm of we can do this, you know, right, just our right. location. Yeah, location. Location can be huge. I mean, people who are outside, you know, Kentucky by the racetracks, the thoroughbred racetracks, or whatever, just location can be huge. I have a friend in West Virginia who runs a rescue. I don't know if she's on or not, but anyway, you know, her location, it's huge that she's there where, where she's well, located. Looking at a Zoom meeting. What'd you say, Stephen? Oh, I guess he wasn't talking to me. All right, so does everybody know how, how this works for strengths? Everybody feel good about strengths? Okay, I'm gonna move on to weaknesses. What is the problems we have? What's the number one problem? Everybody has. Fundraising. Fundraising. Good. Put that as your weakness. I do do a, a webinar on fundraising and grant grant uh, writing. So if Tessa wants to have me back, you can ask her. And I'll be glad to, to do that to, to help everybody. What else besides fundraising? Somebody had mentioned volunteers. Getting volunteers. What else? Program participants. Program participants. That's another great thing to put there. What else? Think about where you struggle. How about having enough time or staff or 
or whatever. Everybody struggling with that? I'm not sure you can hear me, um, yep. but this is Bagaduce River Equine Rescue. And I think one of our biggest um, weaknesses is our lack of um, uh, space. <laughs> there are so many horses that need us and we get so many requests and we just have to say no so often and space is just so limited. And I agree with you, like we can only, I mean, we have space for 40. We technically have 42, but we have space for 40. So I think how many of the rest of you have lack of space? And that's a hard one. That's hard because like you said, there's so many horses needing. That's going to go into our opportunities. I'm going to share my weaknesses. Um, we bought a farm, a nice 60 acre farm, but it has 60 acres of barbed wire. Great for horses, right? So over the years, many, many years, we are replacing and replacing and replacing and replacing, but fencing is expensive. The other thing is we are a large organization, but we don't have major donors. I talk about money as, as cupcakes, regular cakes and wedding cakes. And I don't have wedding cakes. I have a lot of cupcakes. I have a lot of small donors. That being said, a lot of small donors, if somebody decides not to fund me next year, I'm okay. Rather than having that one major donor that pays for just about everything, and if they were to leave, then you're in trouble. So cupcakes aren't all bad. Um, need larger facility and arena. I thought somebody already said that. Low pay for staff, staff especially leadership. An endowment. How many of you have an endowment? Does everybody know what an endowment is? So an endowment, oh, go ahead. Yeah. PBS, they talk about the endowments. Yes, they do. And you think, man, I'm never gonna be PBS, right? <laughs> but an endowment is important as you're, as you're growing. Because again, an endowment shows that you're going to be around for a long time, even after you're gone. And I have a great idea about how to do that. And I'll talk to that, talk to that at the end when we talk about a succession plan. Okay. So lack of endowment. That's something that everybody wants to shoot for later on. And how about a need for volunteers? That was also mentioned. Is there any anything else we want to add to our list? Everybody good with this list? All right, opportunities. I've heard everybody say there are more horses than we know what to do with, so we could put that on our list. What, what other opportunity do we have? I'll give another example, the veterans in the area. They needed a, a, a program and somebody is supplying that program. In my area, I'm supplying a program for seniors. What other opportunity do you have? Why are you, why are you there? Uh, to inform people uh, the need for places for horses in need, and uh, especially ones coming from the reservations. There you go. That's a great one. Yeah, that there's a need even on the on the reservations. What else? What other opportunity could you put in your box? The opportunity to um, educate our youth to carry on what we've started here. Yes, education is a huge opportunity. And that's a great, another program. I don't know if you've contacted your local school systems, but they pay for field trips. When we have field trips out to the farm, it's $5 per kid. And it works out really well. They come for a, like a two hour hands-on, meet the horses, learn all about horse rescue. Um, another great fundraising idea. So education, what's another one? Anybody else want to add to the list or you want to see mine? Here's ours. Um, the need for horse rescue facility in the area. Do you all partner with your animal control in the area and your county? That is another way um, to bring in funding in your, in your area. If you have a business plan, again, and you can provide this business plan to your local sheriff's office, they know that you're really serious. And so there's a need for horse rescue facility in our area. 
And so we have a partnership with our county and they give us $3 a day, which is not very much, but it's $3 a day if they have a seizure and that we're waiting on the horses for um, prosecute, prosecuting. But again, the reason they partnered with us in a monetary way was because we offered something that our local shel animal shelter does not. And they knew that we were a real organization by having a business plan. And I said community organizations needing partners. That's what we were talking about when we talked about the veterans, the schools. Anybody have any other ideas? I would say, uh, actually, you were talking about partnering with local law enforcement and the sheriffs and the animal control. I would say more um, getting on them to do their jobs is an opportunity for us. Yes, very good opportunity. And again, that can also be something that is funded. Um, we have we have the same problem in our area. I think most of us do. So we actually held a training for the officers. And we applied to the officer training program and found out what was required so the officers could get what they call CEUs, continuing education units. Um, and we actually charged for them to come and get their CEUs. And they actually learned and, and we had uh, people donate halters and lead ropes. So every officer would have a halter and a lead rope in their car because we found that, you know, part of the um, program that we did was teaching the officers to halter a horse. And this way they all have halters in their cars. So um, that's another way, again, another money making way, but also a good way for um, informing officers about what you want to do, what you're doing. Anybody else have Sharing and and that that's a fabulous idea to offer to train officers to deal with buggy horses if something happens. Yeah, that's exactly right. I and can give you. I can give, lead rope in their car. Yeah, and I can give you an example of why this came about. Um, I will be glad to share that I had all forty of my horses get loose one day. Um, there was a break in the fence from a fallen tree from a storm. And they were all on the road and we had officers who had no clue what they were doing. And so that's really how that came about. So, you know, things happen. <laughs> but now all our officers know what to do. And if somebody else loses their herd of horses, they'll be able to handle it. All right, then we have our threats. What's the number one threat that you feel your organization has? Y'all should, should be piping in for this one. How many of you have plenty of money? Yeah, lack of funding. Yeah, lack of funding. That's probably the number one for everybody. What else? How, how would it make it so that you'd have to shut down tomorrow besides the money? How's a donor going to know what you really need besides money? Tell them. Pardon? We need to tell them what we need. Yeah, we need to we, we need to tell them what they need. So that's our threats. So what else? I might need some fencing. That uh, lack of fencing might be part of my threats. Here's my list. I need paid staff. Those of you who are talking about more facility, I need a bigger facility. I need arena space. I need another facility close by that can help me. I have no endowment. An endowment meaning that I have no savings to go on forever. Anybody think of any others? For me here with Loco for Long Years, a big challenge that's always ongoing is just not having the left hand communicating with the right hand, if you will. So a borough vehicle collision. Um, the someone at the county, right, it's turnover, and people are not aware of loco, so then they don't call loco when there's an emergency, and so that's always a big threat is losing borough lives that way because people don't always know who loco is, even though we're growing and growing, but it's a challenge for us constantly with the county and with our HOAs. All right, so maybe lack of marketing. Right. So somebody might come in and give you a marketing grant if they know that's what you need. 
You see nice. That's why you want to put this under your threats. And that's okay. a really good one to put under there. What else? Anybody else think of anything? Uh, in our chat, uh, Cynthia sent a message uh, about local wildfire, hurricanes, and extraordinary heat as a threat. That is a huge threat. And also just having an evacuation plan or having facilities to evacuate too. Wonderful. Anybody else think of anything? Yeah, Tessa, keep, keep telling me about the chat because I don't have that up. Yeah, in the chat, we also have a message from Maria about the lack of a succession plan to ensure that the org can continue to provide for the community they serve once the founders retire. Okay, I have a solution for that. So I'm, I'm excited to tell you when we get to the end. I have something that'll help you. Hey, Jaren, Catherine here again. Um, what about you talking about the SLO, the keyword at the beginning? What about yeah. li lack of trust in the community? Because in Virginia, you know, we've had a bunch of rescues that didn't do a great job and we just had a thing with the zoo and you know there's that idea that the community might start to tip the scales might start to tip the scales against the idea of rescue yeah so so again that comes back to marketing and you're in virginia is anybody i don't know how many of you are in virginia but the um, virginia horse council has a five thousand dollar grant for marketing you can get it really easily that would help all of us and the reason they're doing that, Kathleen, is because of the problems that you talk about. So they want all of the good rescues to be marketing better so that the, the state people know about us. So look into that. That's one. That's a great grant. I don't know if there's that kind of grant in other areas or not, but again, that comes back to marketing. Anybody else have any more ideas? Okay, does everybody feel really confident they know what a SWAT is and ha what it, how it re uh, pertains to us? Everybody good that I move on? And if anybody doesn't have any questions, nothing in the chat? I'm getting a thumbs up from somebody. <laughs> Here's something else that I think that we always overlook um, with our organizations, because I know as a nonprofit organization, Horse Rescue, it's like people think all we want is a handout. We want money, we want this, we want that. We're always asking for things, right? But really, we give back to the community in many ways through economic impact. If you think about it, there was a na the national horse industry came out with these statistics, and these are great to have for you to share, that our rescues and the horse industry in general is providing 460,000 full-time jobs, $39 billion are spent, and $1.9 billion in taxes. One thing in Virginia that I did um, was to talk about economic impact is I took the amount it costs for a horse to be boarded and fed and cared for in Virginia, worked out to be about $4,000 per horse. And then I'm like, okay, so I adopted out 554 horses. If each horse costs four thousand dollars to care for, how many jobs and how many how many feed companies and how many what am I impacting? How many hay growers, right? So we don't have to just talk about we need we need we need. We can also talk about hey, we're making an impact on the community. You know, the guy we buy our hay from is profiting from our organization. The farrier is profiting for our organization. The veterinarian, um, you know, if you're building a barn, the contractors. So think about what your organization is doing for the community. And again, this is where you can really get into that social license to operate because again, not only are you asking for the community to support you, you are asking, you are also supporting the community. And I think we forget about that when we think about our organizations. Has anybody else really thought about this? Probably not. Because again, this is something that we need to really be aware of because when I go asking for a business, say I go to Tractor Supply and I want to get, get feed from them. You know, I want, I want Tractor Supply to give me a donation of some kind. Let's say I want 25 bags of senior, pre a pre senior, I know they carry that. And they can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm giving to this, I'm giving to that, I'm giving to that. I'm like, yeah, but just think about it. I've placed X amount of horses in the community that are buying feed from you. 
I am providing customers for your protractor supply. In return, I'd really like you to help me so I can continue giving you more customers. It's a better way of going about asking for some of these donations when you have this information. Anybody have any questions on economic impact? Um, organizational structure. This is kind of how I am organized. We have a board of directors, we have an executive director, assistant director, and farm manager. And then at the bottom, I've added in my programs and what I need for my programs. So I have a senior program, I have an instructor, and I have participants. I have volunteers and visitors. And I have a I have our horses who require a vet and farrier. All of these are part of our organizational structure. Right, so you might have your veterans program. You know, if you have horses and donkeys, I might have one line for horses, one line for donkeys. But this is our structure. And again, most of the time when we think of our structure, we just think of our board of directors, our staff, and our volunteers and visitors. But really, we need to take into consideration, again, the other people in the community that we're serving. So that, again, when I go to that donor, I can say my organization and instructor includes five, 400 participants that have come in this year and come to my programs. That's part of my structure. Now, our board of directors, and I love this picture because this is how we feel about our board of directors, right? How many of your board of directors really are fundraising for you and doing all the fundraising? I have found just in, in collecting research that only 5% of boards really fund their organizations. And a lot of that is because we really don't give our boards guidance to what they need to do. So what I've done is given them a mission. So every board of director that comes onto my board gets a mission statement. And this is what they're doing, they're supposed to do. They're supposed to provide Brook Hill Farm the operational leadership, expertise, time, and effort required to fulfill its mission of rescuing and rehabilitating horses. So I've taken my mission and then adapted it to what the board of directors needs to do. Then I've given them their responsibility, which is to provide expertise, time, and effort in meetings, duties, to ensure that we're able to go on, okay? And then I have a member profile. Who am I looking for? Um, I'm looking for people who are individually and as a team are committed to provide us with the expertise, time, and financial support to fulfill my mission. And then the structure is, you know, what I have, I have an executive team and at least five outside directors, and then I list what they are. And our board of directors are renewed an annually. I don't have a term limit only because if I get somebody good who's raising money, I don't want to get rid of them. So they're renewable annually. I'm not saying that this is going to make your board um, raise money from you, but at least up front, they know what you're looking for. Right, because doesn't this tell you, if you read the, through these, doesn't this show you exactly what I expect my board of directors to do? And this really helps, really helps. Um, the next thing I do is job descriptions for everybody in my farm, on my farm. So the executive director, again, I have a mission statement for my executive director, and that's to provide operational leadership expertise and knowledge. If something happens to you, and I'm going to tell you what we can do to make sure that it goes on at the end, that's your little surprise. But anyway, this is who are we going to hire, right? This is your job description. What do you do? What is your mission? And then your responsibilities. And of course, like I said, I wear just many hats, just like everybody else. I do management in general. I hire, fire, and oversee the staff and volunteers. And just let me let you know, I started out in 2001 with $8,000 and not a paid staff. I now have, have a budget of almost a million dollars and seven staff. So it is possible to grow 
And I will say, if I hadn't had somebody coach me on how to do a business plan, I never would have gotten there. So please know how important this is. I do volunteer management and program management. And then that do it doesn't end there, guys. I do community involvement, marketing, and resource development. Those are all the different things that I do. So make sure when you do this piece of the business plan, you're just listing. What do I do? You know, if you feed horses, you know, put in horse care. And what you're doing with, I mean, I used to do all the horse care. You know, list what you do. Because again, if something happened to you tomorrow and they need to hire somebody, they need to know what you did. Because they may not realize that, you know, you do the water for, you know, the herd of 40. Or you go to the feed store once a week or, you know, all those things that you do. And then I do a profile of what, what kind of person I want. You know, I don't have any um, really um, expertise in web design. If I were hiring somebody, I'd want them to be able to just do the web design because that's an expensive endeavor for our organization. So think about what you would want, you know, the ideal person walk is stepping into your shoes. Who would you like them, what would you like them to, what would they look like? And then your other employees or volunteer staff, you should also have missions for them. So for, for instance, I have a vet tech. She started out as a volunteer and now she's paid staff. But again, what is her job? And her responsibilities are to maintain herd health, feed horses, aid in training, maintain all records, help to market programs, provide instruction, manage volunteers. So she has a very, she doesn't just do the vet tech, she's doing a whole lot of other things. And then again, a profile of who I would want her to, what I would like her to look like. And like I said, this was just a volunteer that we ended up hiring. And you can do this for each one of your volunteer positions that you feel is key. You know, I wouldn't bother with just your regular barn help or whatever, but that person who is running the barn help, you know, what do they look like? Any questions? No questions? All right, where does our money come from? Of course, they wanna know this as well. I do a pie graph and just break it out um, into a pie graph. So this is where my money is coming from. If you look, I am pretty well spaced out. My programs bring in 30%, my grants 21%, my individual is 42%, my business is 5%, my events only 2%. Maybe that's because I don't do a good job with my events, I don't know but we're working on that. But that's about how it's broken out. So this way I can show a donor, especially if I don't have a big budget, I can just show them this is what we bring in. This is how it's spaced out. So they could say, well, there's no major donor on your pie graph. Yeah, that's what I need. I need a major donor to take up some of that pie graph. And then we have our financial sheet and I, I have put this in there for you. And I'm gonna use my little mouse here. If you look down here, we have donation income and I've just broken it down into categories that I'm comfortable with. You're more than welcome to add a category takeaway. Again, this is your business plan, but you'd have individuals, businesses, grants and foundation, major donors, total donation income. So I'm just gonna do something that's very simple. And I'm just going to click in, say we had 5,000 from individuals, 3,000 from businesses, 5,000 from grant from a grant. I had a major donor that gave me 5,000. And again, you need to think about what is a major donor in my organization because I have cupcakes and not wedding cakes. My major donor, I mean, if I, somebody handed me $5,000 check, I'd be really happy. And then my total donation income is $18,000, okay? My program fees, I bring in $20,000 for my senior program and my community outreach. I might have scholarships. And when I think of scholarships, we do scholarships for our horses. So we'll say, will you um, sponsor our horses or give a scholarship for this horse to, to be in our program while we retrain or we rehabilitate? My events, 
5,000 capital campaign. If you're running a capital campaign, how much did I bring in? So my total other revenue was 45,000. And if I add them together, I have a budget of 63,000. In my business plan, I do keep this every year. If you've been in business a couple of years, go back and put this in and see how you've grown. It's a great way to do it. So my expenses, I think of my horse program expenses. How much did I spend at 63,000 on horses? 47,000. I paid 10,000 in salaries. My capital project was 5,000 and I did put $1,000 into an endowment because I want my donors to know that I'm serious. My total expenses were 63,000. I didn't have a profit or loss this year. So this is what my sheet, my balance sheet would look like. Now, we're asked to get, provide a budget for next year and we're asked to project out, how do you see yourself growing? So if you're only been in business one year, it's really hard to tell, but let's just say, I'm just gonna use one category. Let's just say in year two, I had a second major donor that gave me $5,000. So I have 10,000. And somebody asked me, can you project out to see how much you're gonna have, you're gonna shoot for for next year, right? Because if I got one, what could I get next year? So there is a formula and I hate math, so I will begrudge it, but it's growth percentage rate is your second year minus your first year divided by your first year. Project it out. So if I look at this, I'll take my $10,000 from here, subtract my $5,000 and divide it by 5,000. Again, I've used nice simple um, math, so you can see this. So I had 100% growth. Everybody see that? If anybody's not following me, put it in the chat. Tessa will let me know we need to do it. Everybody okay, Tessa? Okay. So I look at year two, 100% of $10,000 is $10,000. So my year one, my goal would be to go on and double it, just like I did the first time. That's my projected growth rate, if everything is going well. And we know that never happens because we may grow more in one area than we do another. But this is what your potential is. So the financial people tell me. Everybody follow that. So we talked about that strategic plan and how important it is. So on my strategic plan, I say I have individuals, the, the actual cash they gave me was 5,000. I wanna try to get to eight because I tend to be very, um, I, don't, I don't think that I can do as well as maybe I could according to that growth rate. So I think I can get $8,000. Well, how am I gonna do that? That's what a strategic action plan is. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna try expanding my mailing list and I'm gonna start a monthly newsletter. For those of you who don't know, MailChimp, it's free to do a newsletter up to 10,000 recipients. Well, I don't know about you, but I maybe have a thousand of that on my newsletter list. So this is something free you can do and believe it or not, it does generate income every month that I do a newsletter. I'm looking at my major donors. I have my five for the first year. My projected is 10. How am I going to do that? I want to increase, I need to increase it by one major donor. So I might want to say, where am I going to find that one major donor? Well, I may talk to the other one. You know, people, everybody has friends. I'm assuming that my major donor has friends with money as well. I may have a meeting with them and ask, you know, do you have anybody else who might be interested in my mission that you can introduce me to, to help? And remember, when you're asking for money, never ask for money, ask for advice. They will give you money. If you ask for money, they will give you advice. Some very uh, wise person told me, so that's, that's basically how I grow. I ask for advice. So rather than asking my major donor for $5,000 more, I'll go and say, hey, how can you help me make this happen? 
And you'll be surprised at how that will help you bring in some more money. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so then you wanna have an implementation your five-year plan. So I really wanted to raise funds for a second arena. So I determined what my capital project was. The next year I wanna build it. And then I wanna create and fund programs to use it. So just take whatever it is you wanna do and break it out over five years. If you want to build more fence, that's usually in my strategic, I'll say in 24, I want to do 500 more feet of board fence. 2025, I might want to do another 500 feet of board fence. Put those things in because again, a donor might say, hey, I want to give you some funds. I want to give you $15,000, but I want to do it over three years. What are you going to do with it? I can pull this strategic five-year plan out. So here it is. You give me 5,000 seed money the first year and then guarantee me another two $5,000 drops. Maybe I can match it. Maybe I can, you know, and then they know exactly what you're doing. And they're going to be more interested in giving you that $15,000 rather than saying, well, now I have $15,000. What do I want to do with it? They already know exactly that I have plans where I have needs. And then you write your conclusion. This is just a summary of what you do, where you want to, how you want to move forward. I think sustainability is the key for all of us. And then you put your contact information. And then we're going to talk about the, the little carrot I'm going to give you for a succession plan. So how many of you are the executive director and really don't have money to pay somebody to step in your shoes if something happens to you? Most of us, right? So the first thing, and again, I didn't come up with this. Some wise person told me the first thing to do when you open up your own organization is ask your board to take an insurance policy out on you, a term insurance policy. So my board took a $100,000 term insurance policy out on me with, the, with them being the beneficiary, with the idea, and the board paid for it, with the idea if something happens to me, they have $100,000 to pay somebody to step in my shoes. Isn't that brilliant? Wish I could tell you I thought of that. But it's a, something that's very simple and it's very inexpensive to do. And it's something that will guarantee your organizations going moving on and again i can tell my donors that yes there is money there's a hundred thousand dollars in this account that is not being able to be touched by anybody but if something happens to me there's a hundred thousand dollars to keep the organization going and again that amount will be whatever you need to keep your organization moving forward so i will say this business plan i updated in january um, and then, like I said, a few things along the way, but once you have it done, you just add to it every year and you'll see this document just grow and grow and grow. And again, if somebody comes to my office, you know, a donor, I have copies printed off in a um, folder with a business card that I can hand to people so that they can pass them out to their friends or whatever, and they have any information they need. So. Business plan is done. What are your questions? And I love this little horse with a question mark. Any questions? That's a lot of information, everybody. Okay, we have a question in the chat from Dee Dee. And it's, is the insurance only good if you pass away? What if you become unable to fulfill duties uh, or disabled? That's a really good question. I only got the one if I was past, gonna pass away. Um, I would think that there would be other insurance policies that could add that on. I mean, they seem to have insurance for everything. So uh, Dee Dee, when you find that out, please email me when you find out the answer to that question because I will definitely put it in my presentation. We have a question from Layla that was, how do you mitigate risk of being voted out of your organization? I think um, 
that's a board talk that I give, but I will kind of just tell you what I do because again, that is something that is a concern. So when my board's responsibility is to be there for anything that I need and to financially help me with my mission. So I present them with what I call a consent agenda, which is just, we don't discuss day-to-day -day operations in my board meeting. We discuss how to make more money. So I give them something called a consent agenda, which tells them how many horses we have, how many participants, whether the staff was paid, a few little things, maybe how many volunteers, how many visitors. They look at it. If they have any questions, they may ask, but they have hired me or put me or I am in charge with the idea that this is my job. This is not their job because, again, they have a mission statement about what their job is, and it's not to micromanage my organization. So I don't get that. I don't seem to have that problem. Um, to be honest with you, sometimes I, when I get overwhelmed, I ask them to fire me, but they haven't fired me yet. So, um, but again, by having it separate, they shouldn't be involved in the day-to-day -day organization business. That is your responsibility. And I think by having the job descriptions really makes it clear what they're allowed to meddle in and what they're not. They, might, they may meddle as much as they want in bringing in money. So did that answer your question, Leela? I think that was super helpful. Uh, Elaine had a question. Uh, Layla said yes. Uh, Elaine had a question. How typical is it for a potential donor to ask for a copy of your business plan? I offer it. I offer it because okay, again, yeah. they may not, I want them to know that I'm a real organization and that I've thought this through. So I am transparent. And again, I even place it on that GuideStar website. So if somebody, some funder is looking to donate to a horse rescue and they come up, they pull up my organization, they can download it from there. So I am very transparent. I feel like all the stuff that's on there um, should be knowledge that helps me get funded. If there's something you don't want shared, then I wouldn't put it in your business plan. There you go. Uh, Elaine also had a question about how does an organization predict future donor income in such a roller coaster economy? Um, I think all we can do is hope um, and look at, like I said, I think like, for instance, when I said, according to that projection, um, I should have said 10, I said eight, basically based on, I don't feel that I could get 10 this year. I think I can only get to eight. So I could only add $3,000 to that category rather ten than 10 because of the economy. So I think if you just kind of look around and, and again, the other thing you can look at too, I think that's really helpful is if you put all this income you've had over the years, you can see how you've grown. Like I can look at COVID and see that we were very stagnant. And then after COVID, we're growing again. So obviously if we have another pandemic, I'm not going to think that I'm going to get that much more money, I'm going to know we're going to be, I'm going to just hope we can pay our bills kind of thing. You know what I mean? So I think when you put your, um, the income and the expenses out, I can also see that feed grew five, that, you know, like feed has gone up astronomically. Everybody else, everybody can knows that. And, you know, this year anyway, for me, you know, we went from a $35,000 budget to a $53,000 budget. So I know that I don't think feed is going to jump like that again. God help us if it does. But again, um, I can look at the trends once I put those numbers down to see. So I think it's gonna help you make those predictions. And I think you predict it out according to how you're feeling. Like in your area, I mean, we're in a college area. We have like four different colleges in our area and universities. So we don't really feel uh, when the economy swings. But again, if you're in an area that has a plant that has a lot of layoffs, obviously you would not put, you know, you might not have as many individual donations, but maybe that's when you go out for more grants. And again, that's the purpose of the business plan is so that you can see those trends and see how where you need to pick up money. So if you can't get it in one area because of say the downward economy, maybe people are granting more or maybe businesses are giving more, you know? Does that help? Absolutely. Um, Lisa had a question. Also about the board, uh, do you have anything written in your bylaws to protect you from being kicked out by the board as well? No, I do not have it in the bylaws, but I have the bylaws that what the board's mission is and nowhere does it say to kick me out. <laughs> okay, it says financial responsibilities. 
and providing the executive director with the things, tools they need. So nowhere does it say the executive, executive director, I mean, it specifically states basically what they are responsible for. Now, if I disappear, then it's their responsibility to rehire or replace. But it, nowhere does it say they have that, just like they can't fire any of my staff either, that being volunteer or paid. That's my job. Lisa says, thank you for that answer. Um, Donna had a question about where do you load the business plan? I assume like where on your website is the business plan? Okay, on my website, it, my business plan is not on my website, it's for a request, um, but it's on the guide star. So because if a donor is searching, I don't have, I don't have my tax returns on my, my website. My website is more fun about, you know, places, you know, and if you want more information, they can, but I don't even put the financial piece on there on the website. That's just personal preference. So absolutely. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, let's see. Nikki has a question. How would you suggest a rescue prepare to ask for corporate sponsorship? Again, if you do this business plan, and I'll get my video going again. Um, if you do this um, business plan, again, if I were going for corporate sponsorship, I'd have a a page where I'd have a letter saying, you know, this is what we're doing. You know, we're looking for a corporate sponsorship of $500 this year. And then the business plan would be behind it along with my 501c3 form, you know, saying that I am a 501c3. That would be all in a packet to give to the corporation. Great. Um, Donna has a follow-up question. So she said, so you load the business plan on GuideStar. Thank you. Do you include financials? Yes. And on GuideStar, they will be pulling your tax return. So I just upload it for them because, again, they're usually a year or two behind. So the minute my tax return is done and signed off, I go ahead and upload it so that they can see that. Great. So, yes. Uh, Ren says, no questions, but wanted to share that this was incredibly helpful. And thank you. Oh, well, thank you. My goal is to get everybody financially solvent so maybe I can retire. <laughs> Donna says the same. Thank you. Super informative. Helpful. Very helpful. So wonderful job. I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Joanne. It was so great and so helpful. And thank you to everybody who attended today. Your participation was amazing. Um, yeah. So we'll have the recording out in the next day or so, uh, probably next week. I'll email it to everybody who registered. And then also it will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you hop on our YouTube page, you'll be able to find it there. I'll also link to the uh, blank business plan template, as well as a filled out one you can use to compare to. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Joanne, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, if anybody wants to contact me directly, um, my email is right here on the bottom of the screen, if you can still see it. Um, you know, feel free if you need, have any questions, I'm available by email or by phone, whatever, because like I said, my my mission, our mission for Brook Hill is education. So the more people we can educate, the more people we can, the more horses we can help. Thank you so much. What a perfect segue. This fits right into your mission. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.